been programming and tinkering with computers since I was pretty young. These pieces like click in your head and you're just like, oh my God, like internet money with no middlemen and it's like cryptographically secure. It's mind blowing. These computers are talking to a ton of other computers trying to come to consensus on what the network is doing. The coordination is like wildly complex. When I look back, I am very like proud of how we managed that balance and how we didn't over engineer, but we did engineer to fit for a lot of the problems that we had. I'm Brett Gibson and welcome to HiBit, a new podcast where we do deep dives on the art of problem solving with engineers and technical experts from our community of early stage startups. In today's episode, we're sitting down with Aaron Henshaw, co-founder of Bison Trails, a blockchain infrastructure platform acquired by Coinbase in 2021. Now Coinbase Cloud, they simplify the process of running secure, geographically distributed nodes on various blockchain networks. A high bit is the most significant part of the binary representation of a number. In coder jargon, it commonly refers to the most important thing you need to understand in a given context. I chose to name this podcast High Bit because when faced with engineering problems, the first task is often figuring out which part of the problem most affects the outcome you're driving towards. Join me on this journey as we discuss thorny engineering problems with my guests and get into the weeds about how they solve them. Hey Aaron, thanks a lot for being here. It's great to see you. Yeah, great to see you too. It's been a little while. Thanks for having me. Let's start with describing what Bison Trails did. Bison Trails was an infrastructure as a service platform. Uh, we served custodians, exchanges, uh, institutions, and developers with infrastructure for their blockchain needs. We s ran across 30, 35 uh, different networks, and we focused on both staking and read-write infrastructure. So our customers could come in, they could spin up a validator node, or they could spin up an RPC node. They could choose different configurations and where they wanted to put it, and then they were off to the races to do whatever they wanted to do to interact with blockchains. I know we've been speaking for a while about the the level of complexity that actually is, is in running these types of networks, and, and we'll get into that somewhat. But let's start with your background. You know, how how did you personally, you know, become uh, an engineer? I don't know how exactly it started, but I mean, I've been programming and tinkering with computers since I was pretty young, like. 10, 11, 12 type of thing. Like that's when I took apart my first computer and I shortly thereafter started like programming AOL, like messenger bots. That was back when uh, AOL was a thing and you could like kick people offline. And that's where I like, it, for whatever reason, learned Photoshop and programming. I like, uh, that was visual basic. And then eventually I went to college for it. Um, I just always enjoyed being able to like solve problems and have like really quick feedback loops and you could do things and it was suddenly like incredible what it could do. Um, and I just went deeper and deeper and then I got a job and as a computer scientist or engineer, <laughs> um, and the rest is history. So yeah, I think I've always liked it and just, I was lucky. Like my parents were like, yeah, this was, it was not a thing. Like nobody was like, this is a good career. They were like, yeah. this is a toy. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is funny how like the, the entry points are often these like, uh, sort of toyish platforms. I, I, I first started programming in flash, which is you know, just like this animation authoring environment yeah. sort of thing. Um, uh, and then, so from, how did you, you know, how did you go from there? How did you meet your co-founder Joe and, and end up starting Bison Trails? I mean, we were roommates in college as how the way that we met was we actually had a mutual friend and we all decided to like room together and that mutual friend for whatever reason didn't like make it to that semester and Joe and I knew each other but like we weren't as close this this other guy was like the middle person and then suddenly we were just like two roommates in this place together and then we became very close um and we were always interested in similar things for whatever reason, we did our economics thesis together. Like we co-wrote our graduate economics thesis together, and then we got similar jobs. We probably have been trying to start companies for who knows how long, um, even in college. But after college, we went into financial services. It was like during the great financial crisis. And so people were just like, get jobs and hold on to these jobs or whatever. But we really didn't like that. And we tried building like a, 
um, it was called Top Five MCs, but it was like a clone of Mafia Wars. We tried like a messaging app. We tried a social like meeting app. We tried a bunch of stuff and nothing really worked. We didn't know what we were doing. And then we joined a startup in New York. Um, and the, since then, then we, that was really great and we learned a lot. And then we started a company called Grand Street, which was our first venture backed company. And that we sold to Etsy uh, a number of years ago. And then we worked there for a while. And then we started Bison Trails after that. Cool. Okay. And then, so what is, what was the crypto path? I know you, I know you, you know, you kind of, you went down the rabbit hole and, and tried a few things before you ended up on uh, infrastructure as a service. Yeah. I mean, I think the first, like, there's a few places where crypto has like kind of popped up in our, I would say our lives because we experienced it together, but in my life, um, the first one, this guy that sat next to me at the startup that we joined, he got fired because he was like messing around and the CTO at the time, like looked into the servers and it turned out that we were having problems scaling, but we had all this hardware. It was back when people bought machines mm -hmm. and he was running Bitcoin miners <laughs> like across all the machines and he probably did really well because that was like a tremendously long time ago. Um, and so that happened. And then uh, I would say at Grand Street, we like integrated this thing called Dewalla and we were accepting Bitcoin at that point. Um, and then we never really had time to dive into it um, until really after Etsy. And this was like 2017, probably 2016, 2015 was when I started like paying attention a little more, maybe buying a little bit of Bitcoin because I thought it was interesting and like nerdy, but not I didn't know or understand. I would be lying if I was like, I knew this revolution was coming. Like, I was just like, this is neat. Internet money is cool. I'm going to buy a little bit and see how it goes. Um, and of course I sold it when it like went up, but like just a little bit, that was unfortunate. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, after Etsy, we were able to like take a year off and just kind of explore. And we spent some time just like actually diving into the technologies we like built some arbitrage bots when exchange arbitrage was possible for like non HFT people. And so we could make a little money. Then we had these tokens and we we're like, well, let's learn what they do. And then we learned what they did and we were like, wow, this is actually really cool. Like this is a crazy thing. That's going to change a lot of things. And what, once that happened, then we had like the bug where I don't think that we could turn back. Like once the, you know, there's like the self sovereignty piece. There's like this censorship resistance piece. These pieces like click in your head and you're just like, oh my God, like internet money with no middlemen. And it's like cryptographically secure and you're just like, it's mind blowing. And so I think we wanted, we knew we wanted to start another company. We didn't know in what, but I think we had already been caught by crypto. We were already on our way down the rabbit hole. And so it was just a matter of time before we probably ended up here. Anyways, um, and I think one of the first big questions we asked was like, okay, we, we kind of understand some of this stuff, but we really don't know how blocks are formed. It was like at the core, like this whole thing, blocks are pretty important. Um, and so the way that we decided to kind of solve that was to like start mining and building miner mining operations. And like we built the reasonable size, like multi megawatt facility in the Pacific Northwest for Bitcoin mining and yeah, so that's how we got into it. And we probably started with proof of work just to solve the like, how are these blocks formed? How does this work? And once we figured out that, then we start to play around in proof of stake. What's particularly hard about running nodes and infra on distributed consensus networks? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what's hard about it? There's so <laughs> many things that are hard about it. I think, um, I think that, you know, the reason that people ask that question is a reasonable one, which is like, well, you run like Kafka for people or you run MySQL for people and like people love to use those products on AWS and GCP. And so there is like system parallels between what they do and what we did. But I think the complexities come in in these computers are talking to a ton of other computers and trying to come to specifically the validators trying to come to consensus on what the network is doing. The latency matters very much. Like it's very important that they're secure, but able to talk over peer to peer. I think potentially the hardest problem, which isn't explicitly like super technical, but it's that there's 30 or 50 or hundred of these networks that like really, really matter. 
and they all have independent developer teams and they're all just people, very smart people, but they're just people building stuff and they make mistakes and they have release schedules and they push emergency updates. And when you're running this stuff, the emergency updates are like breaking for the network if you don't do it in tandem. And when the network halts, you have to get up and you have to coordinate with all these other independent bodies that are also running this stuff. It's the coordination is like wildly complex. I would probably say is probably what really like makes it different and why AWS didn't just do it quick immediately or GCP. Also, you know, I think the market size, the perceived market when we were doing it was like, this thing is just silly. Um, and now it seems less silly, you know, five years later. Like, where did you start? You know, did you, did you, do you feel like you understood the scope of the problem when, when you sat down to build a, build a company around this idea? I mean, in some ways this was like, this was a really cool, like journey, the, the five years, but it was like, we like flicked a pebble off of a hill and then it just, the hill kept getting steeper and the pebble kept getting bigger and it did, it legitimately didn't stop until like two months ago and it's still rolling. I just am not working on it anymore, but like, it's crazy. Um, so when we were building the proof of work mine, the interesting thing about that is, um, there's a lot of start and stop time. So you have to like work with engineers to get all these plans built and then you gotta wait for permits to get created and people have, people have to go back and forth or you have to order a bunch of parts and you get that order, but then you're waiting lead times for that. So in between working on that, we were tinkering inside of discords at the time and like what attracted us to that? I don't know. Like we were working with this venture fund notation at the time and they were, we're friends with them from before and they had invested in this company called five peer. And they were running validators for them. And like, we were just talking to them and we started to look into running a live peer validator. And then we we're like, oh, what about Tezos? That's actually live. But Cosmos is doing the test nets. So like what happened was we ran one and we we're like, oh, this is pretty cool. And then we ran two. And then before we knew it, we were running like 10 networks worth of stuff. And some of them were live and we were making money. It was just Joe and I, like we'd get up in the morning and get on Google Hangouts and we'd just sit on our terminals and like try to get these things working. Um, and we'd put them in Tmux, like, <laughs> you know, like Windows, because they stay persistent when you leave. We didn't like, there weren't services yet. It was like just trying to figure it out. Um, and I don't think we understood the scope of the problem until we were like, it would, not that we understood what it would be long term, but at least like some point we're running six or seven, eight of these networks. And the maintenance of that for the two of us manually doing it in these windows was like a full time job for both of us. And we're like, this seems like either it needs to be a company or we have to like stop doing it because it's a full time situation. And so then we sat down and we started to model market size and like, okay, if the market cap of these things happen. If ETH switches, if like, if all of these things occur, like what is our market if we have 5% or 10% of it? And we realize, like, Hey, that's a really good market, like a really big opportunity. If we believe in the growth of this, of this particular consensus mechanism, and if we believe proof of stake is going to be the future of a lot of these networks, then this is the bet to take. Um, and so then I think we came and talked to you <laughs> and I think you, you agreed and like that we worked together, but, um, then we had to, we had to build a team and we had to build like something to automate this stuff. We had to reduce the, the amount of work, but, um, no, we didn't know the complexity, but we, we, we continued to learn how complicated it was, honestly, like uh, over time, it always kind of surprised us. These hard to build, uh, open source projects. That are a bunch of novel, highly technical software are hard to even get running in any environment at all. And it sounds like that was the, the immediate through line. No, no one can run these things, and, and we've sort of figured it out. I would just say, if you go back to why we like even started in this direction, I guess it was the proof of work stuff. But the other thing I forgot to mention was we wanted to build like more consumer oriented, like front end applications at first on the blockchain. We played around with building a wallet. We played around with like some concepts around data ownership protocols and it took me and Joe so long to get like an Ethereum RPC node running on a testnet and a mainnet 
that like by the time we did that, like the wind was out of our sails and we were just like, what were we even doing? Like that just took us two weeks. Like why? <laughs> like like syncing, it's way better now. The, the software is better. The options out there are better. But at the time it was like incredibly difficult. And people would be like, oh, you have a node sync? Like, can you give me the URL? Like, that would be <laughs> awesome. Um, and so then we kind of realized, like, oh, there is also a market here. People would prefer not to be running these things, but they would prefer, they, they want to interact with the blockchain, but they don't necessarily want to do the infrastructure work, the DevOps work. That's what they would prefer to avoid. And what, what was the moment, was there a moment when you turn the corner from, you know, these nodes are hard to run to there, like, there's a through line here, we can stand up a distributed infrastructure system of our own. And like, you know, like, did you really like, how did, how did that look? What did that look like when you sat down to architect what the platform would eventually be? Yeah, so that's a good question. I would say, so like any of these systems, the platform has gotten, has evolved over five years and like is way better now than it was when we first built it. But I think, so we were able to pull together a team of like really good infrastructure engineers, like people from AWS, people who came from like Tumblr infrastructure, people who were just like, and people who had blockchain experience too. They somehow like both had done some blockchain stuff and had experience in these like infrastructure heavy organizations. And so we pulled these folks together and we did a lot of like brainstorming and discussion on what, what problem we were solving. There was a period of time where we were just trying to like figure it out and tinker. Um, but at some point we were like, okay, we have enough here. Um, I, you know, some of the things that we did well, so we it, probably five people brainstormed into this, uh, platform, the separation of like control plane and data plane was a really important early thing that one of the AWS guys brought. And he was just like, this is the best way to do this. Like you will be able to do so much more if these things are not tightly coupled. And so that was like a very important thing. Um, thinking through like what was out there and available to us around orchestration and automation of like container management. And so Kubernetes was maybe not like the pure obvious choice at the time, but it was close to the point at which it would have been the obvious choice. And so we picked that to hopefully abstract away a lot of things that does introduce like problems down the road that we solved and Kubernetes got better also. Um, and so we did that. And then, you know, we had to build some sort of like, uh, we just needed to implement automation to make upgrades easier, to make spinning these things up easier because, you know, it could, when you do it yourself, it's very manual. You're like, okay, I got the container running. I have to issue a transaction, then I need to like change a flag, then I need to restart it, then I need to do this. And I need to make sure the peers counts are healthy. I need to make sure that the hard drive isn't pegged. I need to make sure that it's on the right machine. And so we used a lot of like off the shelf stuff and then we stitched it together with, um, like a resource management workflow management system. Um, if we built it again, maybe we would have used like temporal to start, which is that like workflow async system um but we kind of built our own version of it at the time i think cadence was temporal and uh, it, we just didn't choose it but we built this really low, little simple thing that pretty much just ran terraform against our data plane and, and like that was the whole thing it tracked <laughs> the inputs and it tracked the outputs and it just ran terraform and so you had like a create script that you had to build. You had a like, uh, upgrade script, which was pretty much just create reapplied. And then you had like what it would be like to destroy it. And it just used Terraform to do all this stuff. Like Terraform makes a lot of this stuff really, really easy, not easy, but like possible, I would <laughs> <Tractable>. say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tractable. Uh, exactly. But like this all seems hard enough, right? Like you, like getting these things running, um, getting them synced getting them like participating in the peer to peer network is like, you know, this, this base, you know, this table stakes for running this stuff at all. And then all of a sudden we layer on slashing. And so like how early was like slashing on your radar? I mean, you can explain what slashing is and you know, were there yeah. early networks where that was a problem or, you know, like, was there a specter of it the whole time? Yeah. I mean, I think slasher is probably on our radar the whole time because it was very early introduced with like the cosmos, um, PBFT stuff. So slashing is 
the penalties that are applied to validators if they like misbehave on the network. And that misbehavior can be like intentional and malicious, or it can be accidental and the network doesn't know the difference. And so it doesn't care. You don't get like bonus points for whoopsies. Um, and so the two main things are equivocation, which is like a, you propose the same thing, like different things for the same block height. That's a big no, no. And the other one is downtime. And so like, if you're down, you can cause the network to go slower. And so if you're down for too long, then they'll slash you. And so those are like the two most common things. Um, the interesting thing is that they're, um, counterbalanced to each other and how you would solve for them. If double signing didn't matter and uptime is everything, you would just run two of them in different places and like, just let them do their thing. But if you have two of them online at the same time with the same keys, you are going like double sign guaranteed. And that's a way bigger penalty. And so, um, you can't like, you actually, we always like early on, we figured this out and this was something we kind of like built into our culture was we favored downtime over high availability for validator nodes. You just had to, because you get a 5% slash for double signing or later, um, correlated slashing got introduced and the correlated slashes for double signing on Ethereum or Polkadot are like way higher than, um, just downtime. And so you would always favor a downtime slash because you would lose less money. Um, and you often have like 18 hours or something, 10 hours to like recover. And there's no recovery from double signing. Like once it's sent, it's sent, like you're screwed that you're, it's, <laughs> um, so yeah, with, you have to layer on these, um, the incentive mechanisms and how they work to incentivize or disincentivize behavior into the infrastructure that you're building. Um, I think something that always comes to mind is like block, especially validators are like they're sheep, they're not cattle, which is like a common, you know, we want our infrastructure to be cattle, not sheep. Like we just want it to like come up and go down and like, it doesn't disrupt service. And I think a lot of our goal over time was to like turn those things as much into cattle as possible to make them as like resilient and able to restart and come back and come without causing any problems for the networks that we were running and like still not fully solved, but we did a lot to get there, to get to a really good place, I think, over like the, the time period. Well, what's interesting is it sounds, I mean, it sounds like a technical problem in its face, but there's sort of, a, there's, a, there's a social problem and, and, a, and an, opinionated, an opinionated response to it that, you know, is prioritizing failure mode and timeline and, you know, what, what do we really need to do? Also, I would imagine that your customers don't care, right? They, they just want the, they just want the reward, right? And like they, they don't want to get slashed, but you know, they're, they're, they just they're not reward. as in, they're not in the weeds of the nuances of, of the difficulty. Yeah. I think definitely depends on the customer. I largely, I do think our customers were understanding of the difficulty because, you know, there were a few competitors in the market. And I think that the general consensus was like, this is a difficult thing to do. Yeah. And, um, but we, we also, I don't know that we like, I wouldn't say we never got slash cause there was this thing with, um, uh, keep network or new cipher where like everybody got slashed and then Vitalik gave everybody back their money or something. Um, but for the most part, like we never, that never happened. And so, um, but there, we did have like downtime penalties, right. As a result of the counterbalance and customers were understanding mostly some people less so. And I think to your point, what they really want is for it to work and for them to get their rewards and for them to be able to participate in the governance that they want to, or whatever it else that, that they're trying to do. They want nodes to be like in the background and not bother them. You know, cause you worked a lot on, um, global deployments. Wasn't, wasn't that like a big value prop and, yeah. and that just, that just exacerbates all, all, all of these technical problems. It absolutely does. Um, okay. So, Anti-correlation is like the thing that we would, would strive for. So how can we reduce the correlative properties of our infrastructure? And so a really easy first step is, okay, if everything is in AWS US East 2 and that goes down, then like whatever percentage of the network you're running and your customers are running, it's all offline. Okay. So we could spread to different AWS regions and the infrastructure is similar. 
And so, but then there is some, I think like ethos oriented, but also practical th things where like, we don't want all of the blockchain infrastructure running on AWS. What if AWS changes their terms yeah. of service? What if they hate blockchains one day? What if, or what if they have, a, you know, they can also configure their routers wrong, which can cause like multi like failures that doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's crazy and everything stops working. And so we also layered in GCP as well. And so we went multi-region, multi-cloud. Um, we never quite added Azure. It was like still probably on a list somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. But we did that so that we could distribute the infrastructure for our customers. Um, so And so that we present a lower risk to the networks. Um, yeah, you, you want to be good stewards on the networks on which you're validating. I mean, yeah, our incentives are very aligned with the networks. Like if... If there is something bad that happens to the network that is very bad for our business because the token price will go down, like everybody will be mad. And so we try to do what's best. Like we set um, caps on what percentages we were willing to run. And we did actively turn away business at certain points of our time and like send them to competitors or just tell them no, um, because we weren't real to put networks at risk. It's it's a really interesting problem to be thinking about, you know, where where you where your success uh, changes where you sit in the ecosystem, and especially you know, given the early strategy of of being the easiest way to get these things running and and integrating and helping out the protocol teams themselves. You know, when you look at the problem you bit off and you know, the problem you ended up solving, and you know, uh, you know, no, obviously naturally, like systems get bigger and more complex over time. Like, but what do you think you've learned about the shape of this? And like, you know, do you think it's taught you anything about you know engineering generally? Yeah, it. De I mean, I've definitely learned like a tremendous amount. I've, I've, I've learned a lot about building large organizations, which is something that I had only done to a certain size before and sort of some of the like communication and structural complexities. But I think on the more like technical side, um, it's a really good question. So like, I think some of the things that we did well early was like, we did not try to over engineer things. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that there was probably some opportunities to use like slightly more off the shelf CI, CD that, and bake in a little bit more testing early on that I think like might have slightly slowed us down, but actually sped us up. And I think this may be like one of the biggest takeaways from the whole thing was you should invest heavily in tests, uh, especially even early, like yeah. don't go crazy, right? Like you can't be writing tests for ever but you should have core tests that cover base cases and that like help your, whatever it is that you're deploying. I think I don't, one of the problems was just testing these things was very complicated, which is why I think we didn't do it, but maybe we should have, cause you had to, you have to figure out a way to deploy one. Like it's very hard to create a like virtual environment of it. Cause it has to prepare to the network and peer and it has to do all this stuff. So how do you simulate that? And you can, it's just a lot of work. And so once we did that, I think a lot of our infrastructure became much harder and like much, much better. Um, and we, that happened towards the last two years. Like we actually brought on like someone from Pivotal who like freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> he showed up and was like, you have tests, but you don't have like enough tests. And yeah. um, he spent a, he was great. He spent a long time like getting us to implement a lot of tests and a lot of automation, um, to the point where now, like the dream was always, can you click a button and have parameters around clicking that button around how it treats the infrastructure that it's upgrading and just have this like thing test and upgrade test and upgrade and like pause on tests. If a test fails, like it ejects itself and lets you know, and we, pretty much got there where like you could just run a single command as like an engineer at our team and it would just upgrade like hundreds and hundreds of these nodes in in some sequence it could be parallel it, at a maximum number of parallel items it could just be in series depending on correlated slashing properties of networks like you could build in pauses between groups so you could do like eight and then wait eight hours between an epoch 
and then and that was and so we're like that's what exists now and that's what we always wanted and we did mm-hmm. we certainly didn't have that early yeah that sounds like an amazing system and just the the rigor of infrastructure you have to build that's not the core product sometimes is counterintuitive but you know going back to what you were saying before i think what's always interesting early on is balancing um you know i guess Twitter was hardening these systems versus over overfitting them you know as you're as you're adding incremental customers and networks you know you could go too deep on any one and then you know and you don't and you're just in this kind of fog of war you don't you don't really know where you're handing off uh, velocity for complexity or where you're going to need it yeah. later and you know you're, there's a lot of just like judgment calls that you have to make and they're not right they're just like as good as you can make them at the moment yeah. and as you get more people and voices, like then, you know, not everybody agrees with what you're doing and then you have to like manage that and not everybody's going to be happy, but yeah, I mean, I, I think when I look back, I am very like proud of how we managed that balance and how we didn't over engineer, but we did engineer to fit for a lot of the problems that we had. Um, and I'm sure people on our team and, and myself included would be like, well, but like it created a crazy amount of on-call burden. Yeah. For the early people, right? The first 10, 20 engineers, like on call was rough. And it stayed rough until a lot of these new things came in, but we couldn't have built we would have never integrated any blockchains if we built the thing that we have now. Yeah. You know? Um and so then the business would have failed and it wouldn't have mattered that we tried to do anything. And so you always have to like I mean you gotta like sell to customers like you got you need customers <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> or else you're not going to get to make the system you want yeah I, t- I mean that totally and, and and the bringing on of more people and the how it impacts that totally resonates i remember when um when we were built when gary gary and i were building postures there was a lot of he's you know he's just like build things as fast as possible get them in front of users and i'm like of the school the engineering school of like no this is like supposed to be deterministic there's like correct right like which is like kind <laughs> yeah, of an asin- it's kind of an asinine thing to hold with you but but uh but that's what made it interesting for me today right like the 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 problem solving and, and like tacking toward that it's just like that's what gary should have he should have been saying okay but do it worse <laughs> and faster yeah, yeah exactly yeah well it was kind of like i'll do it worse and faster and then you, you can clean it up <laughs> which which i yeah, think is like exactly. a pretty common pattern right like it's what you have to do. I think we, the only thing I'll say about what this particular thing is that there was, we slightly were further on the like fit scale because there's real people's money involved yeah. and uh, there's real risks to that money. And like there were, it took us a decent amount of time to build the platform itself. And then we continued to invest pretty heavily and grow um, our engineering count for a long time. Because we just had to, like it just. Yeah, that well, that brings me back to what you said before about how you learned a lot about org building and growth, and so like maybe you can talk a little bit about how you thought about who you needed to build out this platform. So the answer to that is like it changes over time, and I think the beginning, the best thing that we did was we actually brought on like a pr- people who were infrastructure forward for sure, but we did have generalists, you know, and like more generalists at the beginning, more people who could both like write JavaScript and do Terraform. And it's a really, that's a really wide band between those two things, but that's what we needed at the beginning because we had JavaScript to write. We actually had like a front end, we had an API to build. So we had a middle and then we had this whole back end. but we also picked a couple like experts at the beginning that were like infrastructure experts and DevOps experts. And we needed that team at the beginning, I think. Um, I think as time went on, we needed a mix of these two people, but we needed more specialists over time. Like you needed like industry trained SREs to come in and like help us stop waking everybody up all the time. Right. We needed like really, really good people with Kubernetes to help us like solve some of the really intricate problems that we created for ourselves. And so I think maybe like eventually you're lucky if you go far enough to be able to hire the people that you need to fix your problems that you created for yourself. Yeah. Um, and that was like really, really cool. <laughs> so like, yeah, that, as that's, you, a, that's a goal. <laughs> Make that a is mess a goal. It's and a, be it's fortunate a enough to hire someone to clean it up. <laughs> yep. 
And those people, you know, they come in wide open, but they like they're so good at it. They're so they're so good at these specific yeah, problem yeah. solving, and like you're just like in awe that they can come in and just like change it all and make it yeah. work like 10x better than what totally. you had. Um, yeah. And so yeah, as we built, then things get more specialized. Teams get a little distributed, um, and you have to change the talent that you're looking for a little bit. And I think one of the hardest things to hire for because there's more people now was like this hybrid blockchain engineer role is what we called it but mm -hmm. like you kind of need to be able to program a little bit you also need to be able to like write kubernetes manifests and understand infrastructure and terraform and the third thing you need is you need to understand blockchain so you need to understand how they talk to each other how the consensus works because you're building into this platform these systems that like can't go wrong um, or shouldn't go wrong they could but hopefully they don't and you need to like understand the boundaries of the networks that you're working with and the more you know over time these networks have gotten more complicated generally not less um introduced new layers that they work with and so it just gets like harder and so that that was a tough one to hire we did a lot of just i think training for those roles yeah i, I hadn't really thought about that but it makes a lot of sense because you you think that if these if the problem was intuitive um it wouldn't be so hard and you know, maybe the answer would be just put it on aws but you know there's the the, the depth of complexity and sort of thinking around it is there i, I was more interested in the, in the technical stuff so i buried part of the lead here like so what what happened to bison trails ah what happened so we started it and then we raised money and we eventually sold to coinbase um in 2021 it was in the pandemic, which is like a whole entire blur of a time. Um, yeah, we sold like maybe four months before their IPO. Um, and I I worked there for two, slightly less than two years, I think. And just recently left, Joe and I both left. Um, and we went through like, a, it was crazy. I mean, like, this is what I mean by the pebble kept getting bigger, rolling down the hill is... We started it and we grew really, really fast. And we did a like, kind of like a quick series A because our revenue was like moving very quickly up and we needed to hire more people to keep up with the demand, which turned very quickly into an acquisition that was like meaningful and like made sense. Coinbase was a big customer and a partner and like we worked really well with them. And then we went in and we like built this thing, Coinbase Cloud there which was like a continuation of bison trails and we set it sunset the brand which was sad but it was like the right thing to do generally for the brand and the, the bigger company well, that we joined except for the swag but except for the swag i miss the <laughs> swag but you can you can now get the swag from mark from alluvial and it is yeah. very good still it's yeah but yeah it was a good it was really good it was a really good outcome we joined like the leadership team like i joe and i ran coinbase cloud for a number of years so what are you what are you up to these days what's what's next for you next i don't know um joe and myself and a third uh, friend of ours carly um she was the founder of BarkBox, uh and i think she kind of is still related but maybe doesn't work there full time or something but um we have like a angel fund uh we just invest our own money and we do a lot of like investing in blockchain infrastructure companies believe it or not and we also do protocol investing we also do like deeper technical stuff um we do and so that's really fun um keeping us active but right now i'm just taking a break like it was a very intense five plus years and i will take a break for a little bit and then we will see what's next probably later at the end of this year or early next year is kind of my plan right now yeah and i have two little kids who spend some time with my kids and they're they're awesome um so that's that's the plan right now but there will be something next like there's too much cool stuff and I, <laughs> I think it'll be in crypto too like there's too yeah. much cool stuff going on in crypto and too much like interesting things to learn or build at the at the moment i definitely agree i feel like part of the part of the part of the thing with entrepreneurship is like a little bit of an obsession and I've always found that when you're working on a product or a company, like you don't have room for other ideas, really. You're just kind of like all your mm -hmm. brain cycles are going to one thing. And so you need a little space to actually figure out what else is interesting. So we took space between Etsy and Bison Trails and like 
having the ability to do that gave us the room to like open ended learn about blockchain and yeah. like we didn't have to force fit anything and we just stumbled into this and I don't know will we do the same thing next time but um, yeah so I mean right now so what am I interested in I I mean there's so much okay so it's probably all going to be like somewhat related to the things that we did but like mev is incredibly interesting and yeah. all the stuff the flashbots and all these companies mm -hmm. are doing um mev reduction mev capture like mev distribution like that stuff is super interesting i think um i don't know i'm, I'm not an expert but like i if if i had which i have opened into time like the thing that i want to dive into is some of the zero knowledge stuff and just understand it more even if i don't do anything with it i think it's like it's very clearly a part of the future um, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Um, some of the fully homomorphic encryption stuff is cool. Like I listened to the Zero Knowledge podcast and there's something called like Sunscreen that seems like maybe promising like later, but it's really cool. Um, so paying attention to some of that stuff. Um, yeah, like transaction encryption, which is all, uh, whether or not that's a real thing, the thing like yeah. victor and i debated and he's like it's never it doesn't matter and i'm like no i don't know i think there's a place for it yeah it's funny they're really like that back to M M mav being uh i guess what what does that stand for now maximum extract i don't know what they did maximum extractable uh, the ability for block creators to to take value out of the, the act of block creation and or secrets um yeah and, and so it's, and it ends up know. related to some of the zero knowledge stuff right because in theory, it's part of the solution. Yeah, but everyone's like, yeah. No, no one sees it. Anyway, and so like yeah. From, anyway, so that stuff is super interesting. Um, yeah. cool. So, well, thank. I mean, this has been this has been a lot of fun. Thanks a lot for for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. It has been a blast. It's always good to see you. <laughs> Likewise. That's it for this episode of High Bit. Our next guest is Jose Kane, co-founder and CTO of Astroforge an asteroid mining company on a mission to bring deep space resources back to Earth. The, the length that we went through to, to solve this problem baffles me to this day. Like it's one of those problems that you're just like, I can't believe we missed that. Like everything's hard about this. You know, if we succeed, we'll be the first commercial company to ever go out to deep space. We actually successfully launched our first satellite into orbit. And this is the first in-space refinery ever to be launched. And we're doing demonstrations and testing on that now. High Bit is produced by Initialized Capital. Our videographer and editor is Jordan Burns. Candy Chang is our showrunner. And I'm your host, Brett Gibson. Thanks for listening. <laughs>